Russ, the voice, Bray, decision has been made, the time has come, you're hanging up the referee's microphone, are you? I am, yeah, it's uh, 27 years with the PDC, and I, I called a couple of years prior to that uh, on the county level, uh, 30 years in, old age pensioner now, and uh, you've got some cracking youngsters coming through, so it's, uh, for me personally, I think it's now time to turn in and say, let the youngsters come through, and, you know, um, I've had a magnificent career so far, and uh, hopefully I can carry on in the background. It's going to be the, the 30th edition of the PDC World Darts Championship final, your final game. It's an iconic way to end, isn't it? Absolutely. I, mean, it's, uh, I was there just after the start, obviously, uh, 94 was the first one, uh, 93 was the first one, and, uh, you know, I came in in 96, 97, so... Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Well, let's take it back to then. The start of your professional working life yep. wasn't all darts, was it? You were a scaffolder, I was. policeman? Yeah, yeah, I've been a little bit of all sorts, really. I mean, I, I left school at um, 16 and joined the police cadet, met police cadets. Um, and then you, you become a copper proper then, as they call it. And then uh, I come out there in 89. So I actually, you know, time scale in the police was 16 years. Um, I then came out of there and I went as a driving instructor with British School of Motoring, BSM. And I've done that, but I'll tell you what, you, you've got to be a different animal to do that type of job because it's, uh, that, can be, that can be scary, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> someone who's never driven before and it's, uh, or someone who doesn't really listen. But it, it, it then went on from there. I then went on and, you know, uh, lorry driver for Dow Egbert Coffee and things like that. Mm. Worked with Security Corps. I've done a few jobs. I mean, I was I'm never out of work, but uh, done a few jobs and then uh, eventually ended up scaffolding. We'll talk about darts in a minute, but you're also, the lads here all know, um, but your time as a high jumper, a bit of an athletics uh, man yeah, back in the day. very much so, yeah. I, don't, I, I belonged to Thorough Carriers back in the day, back in, uh, God, it was when I joined them, I would have been, I'd have been, perhaps about 1970, I suppose, something like that, 13, 14 years of age. And then um, high jump was, I, I won the high jump at school in a sand pit, so you jump out a bar in a sand pit. And uh, that put me in the district sports, uh, which was at Gray's in Thurrock, uh, at Thurrock Harris ground. And uh, I won the district sports, won a gold medal, and uh, I really enjoyed doing athletics, I loved it. And uh, I just developed from there, practice, practice. I joined the club. And a, a good coach in them days. Uh, I tell you who I was alongside, funny enough, was Maggie Whitbread, who was uh, Fatima Whitbread's mum. Mm. And Fatima was younger than me, but she used to be doing the javelin alongside me while I was doing the high jump. So, uh, you know, it was, it, there was good coaches there uh, at Tharagaras, and I just went on from there. I represented Essex, represented Great Britain um, over the years, and... Uh, you know, and then you get too old for that, you know, that athletics and that. So. so where did the passion for darts, where did that first come in? I'll tell in? you what, the first came in in the police, I was in training school, uh, and that was 1975. And one of the lads there played darts, um, and he had two houses. Um, so one was playing against the other in a championship at Hendon. And the guy to him and said to me, making up a darts team. I said, man, I never thrown a dart me off, and then picked one up. He said, but we need someone to throw a dart, make the team up. I said, oh, okay, I'll come in there. And I got these brass darts, and I, I threw it there. He borrowed us. I threw them, and I threw them pretty straight. Decent high hand coordination. And uh, we ended up winning the thing. Not that I hit doubles or done anything spectacular. But as a team, we ended up winning it. I won a little medal again. I thought, wow. And I'll, again, it's a, a, a sport that I really enjoyed doing. So eventually, when I got home, I got back, I bought a dartboard, a little paper thing out of Woolies, you know, that lasts you about two minutes. Um, set, a, set of darts and just went from there, just practiced practice. Then joined the Met Police darts team, um, like local team that we played in the local league. And my darts just developed from there. And then it's something, if I do something, I don't like to do it half cocked. I want to go and do it fully, you know, 100% or not. My, my dad always said that, don't, don't go and do it half cocked. Go and do it 4%. If it don't work, go on to something else that you want to do, but don't, don't play at it. And I just practice, 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 go through dart balls, go through, change all the different darts all the time, a bit like Peter Wright right a minute. Change all the different darts and all the rest of it until you find a set that really suits you. And, uh, and mine just went from there. So I ended up playing, you know, decent set of darts at a decent standard. 
so then how did that lead to you first starting calling and, uh, and life as a referee? Well, what happened was um, I was playing county for Hertfordshire and um, the county caller at that time, there was two of them, Trevor Wood and Steve Smiley. Steve Smiley was the main guy and Trevor Wood was the second. And Steve Smiley never turned up as the referee. So a, a county set up, as probably most people know, is referee, two markers, exactly as it is on TV. And Steve never turned up, so I turned to him, look, I'll help out, I'll call a couple of games. Trevor Wood called uh, as the county caller then. I stood in, called a couple of games, as did a couple of other lads. Come off the stage, and I really enjoyed it because it was something so totally different to actually throwing your darts. Then the following month, that we, or the following time we was home, Steve Smiley never turned up again, Trevor was there. So I was playing in the A at the time. So I went there on a Saturday in the B, and I thought, well, I'll pull this along because that's what that was all, that was mm. what you wore in those days. Put a suit on and called for the you know, couple of ladies' games, and, and the men's, me and Trevor split in off. Um, he never ever turned, I never, I'm, do you know what? I've never seen Steve Smiley since, which is really crazy. Um, but he never turned up. So I became a county caller with Trevor Wood. Now, Trevor was the number one. I was, you know, the new, new boy in sort of thing. Um, I still play county uh, at that given time. Then you had to split uh, in darts, a total split with the BDO, PD, or WDC as it was then, PD, the PDC. And if you had anything to do with the WDC at that given time, you were banned from every other darts. Bear in mind, I played darts on a, I played darts on a Monday, on a played darts on a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday in them days. So it's four nights a week I was playing darts, plus a county weekend if you had a county weekend. Uh, but you got banned from everything. I couldn't even do an exhibition with any of the players. I couldn't do nothing because I was part of the WDC uh, uh, because of joining the WDC. I was also honoured to be a reserve referee with two iconic referees, Bruce Spenley and Freddie Williams. Um, who had already gone over with the split. And I said, yes, I would love to be a reserve referee um, because I don't do politics in general and certainly not politics in a game that I'm paying to play. You know, I mean, it cost me money to play. You know, I wasn't getting any money for it. Um, so I joined the PDC. I went to Blackpool in 96. I called two games on the Sunday night. <clears throat> First game involved John Lowe and the second game involved Paul Lim. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, both the only two players that had hit nine daughters at that given time on TV. So for me, it was it was fantastic. I was nervous as they come. Called those, walked off the stage. When I come off the stage, Tommy Cox, bless him, long gone now, who, who passed um, a few years back, um, found a member of the PDC. He turned around and said to me, he said, we're not having a reserve referee. I thought, oh, I've blown it here. So we're having three referees. Welcome to the PDC. And that was 96, well match play. But back then, did you ever think it would take you to the places oh, that it has really now? No, 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 no. Never in a month of Sundays. My first real full tournament after that was the 96, 97 World Championships. And um, <laughs> we went to Vegas in 97. I think it was the first one when we took over from the North American Open. And we got asked if we was, if we, Go to Vegas, would we mind not being paid? The player flight, but you know, the, the, the funds then obviously wouldn't cover a wage. Um, and the three of us got asked, me, Bruce, and Freddie, and they said to me, Would you go? I said, Yeah, I'll go. Okay. I've never been to America, so it was buzz for me. Um, Bruce and Freddie sort of said, mm, No, not really. Um, so it was their living. Mind, I was still scaffing at that given time. So it, for me, it was, it was a great buzz. And uh, I ended up going to Vegas and, and it sort of developed from there. But, and, and that's how the travelling then, travelling then just went on and on and on, on. You know, I'd never ever imagined that darts would be anything like it is now. Let's talk about the voice brand. Your 180 core obviously is synonymous <laughs> with the sport. If you ask people outside of darts, if they don't know darts, they probably know Phil Taylor and they know you. Yep. They know that call. How did that develop? And how did the brand, the voice, the nickname, how did that develop from there? The 180, I just wanted to be different. And, and I think that's important to any new referees coming in or refer the referees we've got now, we're all different on our 180s. That's, in, that's important to be a different caller. Don't, don't try and copy anybody or emulate anybody. Um, bear in mind, at that given time, my two are the, the, the greatest callers ever. You know, well, Tony Green, I think Tony Green had a great voice. Um, but Bruce Bentley, his voice was extra special. Freddie Williams was iconic and, and 
uh, you know, as well known as anybody's. Um, but I didn't want to be the same. So for them to call the way they did, their 180s, um, my voice was different anyway. So that was a, one lucky distinction that I had, that my voice was so different. Um, so for me to call a 180 would have sounded different anyway, even if I tried to copy them. I didn't. So I, I mean, I just tried to do it differently, which is what I done. Um, similarly, to, you know, to push the brand or push who I am, Bruce and Freddie wore jacket and trousers, so I wore a suit. They said, oh, we wear a suit, so I wore jacket and trousers. So I always, always tried to be different. I then wear a Mandarin collar shirt that don't have a tie. <gasps> Referee on stage, no tie. You know, it, it was everyone wore a tie or a digger bowl, whatever it was. Um, so I just tried to be totally different in that respect. Um, the voice itself, the nickname, actually came from one of the lads at early doors that played in the PDC was Dennis Ovens. And his wife, Kathy Ovens, she um, made a picture and put the voice underneath. And that's really how it came about. It was Kathy Ovens that um, actually called me the voice. And uh, it, just, it just developed from there. She, she made some cards that I could give out and sign to people, early doors, you know, about three or four people that uh, and knew who I was. And uh, that's how it's all come about. This, this might be a difficult question. I know you're a, a humble individual. Uh, to take an introspective look at yourself, do you see yourself as an icon? No. no just an ordinary bloke. No, just, oh, that's all right. I, in life, all I'd ever want if someone said, oh, what do you think of Russ Bay? If someone said, oh, he's a nice bloke, that do for me. That, then you've achieved. Not an icon. Um, um, my job as a darts referee has, what, has made it what it is. And, you know, people see different people in different ways. Um, I'm well known within darts, you know. I'm very well known within darts. Everyone in darts knows who I am. Not everyone knows who you are outside. You're not an A-lister. I'm not an A-lister in that sense. You know what I mean? You know, you sort of weigh down on that sort of thing. A lot of people, it's an amazing amount of people that do know who you are, but mine's mainly to open my mouth. If I open my mouth, I'm like, oh, man, hey, that's the bloke off the darts. You know, don't know your name or whatever. But no, I, I can't, no, not really, not really. You say that, though. Where's the strangest place you have perhaps been recognised? You've travelled to every corner of this globe <laughs> with the sport. You must have been recognised in some interesting places. Everywhere. Everywhere uh, someone has recognised me. Um, Mongolia, you know, uh, in Mongolia. Um, Asia, obviously. I mean, I do, I'll do Asia anyway, but my first trips out to Asia, um, when we first went to China, went to Shantou, and um, people there. Um, all four corners, I guess. It, you know, I've, I've, someone's clocked me somewhere along the line. Um, we were in Mexico, me and the missus on holiday. It's come out a long time. And um, just after, just after 9-11 it was, and landed in Mexico, come out, then gone to the hotel, checked in, got out to have a little walk around like you do, and uh, a little Mexican fella came out. Hey, oh, voice, 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 voice. I said, hello, mate. Oh, bitch, 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 you know. It's great, it's great. So, Russ, we, everyone we've spoken to today, today talked about your passion for life, the way that you're a happy-go-lucky chap every morning, you're down with a smile on your face. What brings that passion in your life? How do you wake up every morning with that energy? Um, there's always someone in the world worse off than you. And, you know, for someone to be worse off than me, why have I got... I mean, I'm healthy, fortunately, at the moment. Um, I can get around. Um, I can do most of the things that I would like to do. Um, and it's, I, I try to look at life as, look at the fun side of things as opposed to misery. You've only got to turn the telly on and watch the news for misery. If, you, if you're that style of person, you want, to, you want to be a little bit down, just watch the news. I, I very rarely watch the news. So I very rarely know what's going on in the world in that respect. Um, but me personally, I, it, it, a story that comes to mind, or something I can tell you that comes to mind, I was on a flight to wherever it was. I have no idea. I can't remember now. Um, and you're going through the films on the on the TV screen in the plane. And I'd watched all the Bournes and, and all those sort of films and the diehards and everything else. And there was a kid's thing called Kung Fu Panda, which was voiced... The panda was voiced by Jack Black, who I think's a real funny guy. And uh, so I put this kid's film on. Kung Fu Panda, and, and it, was, it was quite funny, actually. It was quite a good film for, you know, animation. But there was one thing said in there that would have gone way over all the kids' heads and everything else. And you've got the little man, the little master who's teaching 
Pen, who's, who's sort of Jack Black, who's sort of all over the place. And he's got his little arms folded like that, long moustache, and he's the master, his only little thing like that. I don't even know what animal he is. But he looks up at the panda and he said, remember in life, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. And I was saying, I thought, wow, that is just so true. Yesterday's gone. I can't change yesterday. I can learn by it, but I can't change yesterday. That's history, that's gone. Tomorrow, I've no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to wake up. You know, if you want to look on the safe side of things, you never know. Yeah? But today's a gift. That's why they call it the present. So live it. Live it, live it the best you can do. One thing in my life that I, I don't want to do is on my deathbed, turn and say, oh, I wish I'd done that when I could have done it. When I could have done it. Not, not, I mean, there's a million one things you want to do. You know, that, that, that you can't. But if I can do something, yeah, over my times that I'm going to have time to do, um, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of things I still want to do. I want to see the Northern Lights. I've never seen those. I want to go to Ruggivik or I'll go into Norway and have a look at it or whatever. You know, things like, I've never been, I've been to Paris on the periphery and around. I've never actually been into Paris. I want to go have a look around there, see, see, you know, Champs-Élysées and things like that. So there's lots of things that I want to do. Um, that's why I smile. I have some, always have something to look forward to, always. Whether it's a holiday, whether it's a break, um, whether it's just a couple of days off, always have something to look forward to, and that's what I do. We'll get back to your time on the hockey shortly, but is that helping drive your decision to finally hang up the microphone in, in the current role you're in? Yes, for one. Um, my wife's going to retire in January. Sue's going to retire in January. Um, she's just going to do a couple of days a week just to you know, keep her occupied more than anything else. Um, and for me personally, it'd be nice to have a, a few more days at home, you know, during the year. It's uh, 2019, pre-COVID, just pre-COVID, I was home indoors 60 days, which means I was in a hotel room, you know, 300 days. Um, getting older now, not the same. I'm an old age pensioner and I, I, I want to do the things I want to do. And uh, now's the right time. You've got the youngsters coming through, Charlie Goldstein, people like that coming through. Hugh Ware's a fabulous ref. Kirk Bevins, you know, and George Noble, of course, but George's a bit older, but Kirk, all the youngsters there. And it's evolution. It's going on. You know, I've, I've done, in very commas, my time. Uh, these guys are brilliant refs. They really are. They don't make no mistakes. They're absolutely bang on on what they do. Um, my time. I've done my time now. I've done my time. Let's talk about your time. Yep. 27 years with the PDC. Yep. You've seen some of the greatest moments of this sport and you've been a part of those moments, haven't you? Any in particular that stand out for you? 2002, Phil Taylor's nine data against Chris Mason at Blackpool. Um, I was a ref there, so of course, I was the first referee to call it live on, um, on Sky TV, because Sean, Sean Greatbatch, bless him, passed now. He done it live a week before on Dutch TV, so it wasn't the actual first live TV, but it was first one on Sky um, and first one for the PDC. Merv King and Nine Data in South Africa, um, so that was something very, very special. The two, most special of all is the 2007 World Championships um, Barney Taylor final, which was, you know, still said to be the greatest final ever. Um, I was fortunate enough to call that, and it went down to the sudden death leg. I had to throw for the bullseye. Um, Barney won the ball. Taylor hit a 180. Barney followed him and uh, then went on and won it. That was just immense, absolutely immense out of this world. John Park, I mean, it's all about beating Phil at the minute, but John Park, when he beat Phil in 2003, was again another amazing final, amazing achievement and, you know, a milestone. We talk about iconic moments. One of the most iconic for a lot of people is the 17 perfect darts, which you called. I did. Obviously, the players in those moments, the pressure is intense, immense. For you, how is it being that close to something like that, a moment of history? Hold it. I, I, it's, um, you, you're a dart ref, so you, you've got to be totally impartial. And, and, but in your head, in my mind, I think, oh, please, come on, dart, double 12, please, please, please. Because you want... You want it for the player as well. The crowd are amazing because you hear the first, you know, the first, well, we had the first nine, and then he's gone 180, 180. You think, oh no, he's going to do it again. 
it's a treble 20, treble 19, and the crowd, the noise, oh, it's going to be there. And, and you've got that inside, but you've still got to be cool as a cookie company, you know what I mean, standing there. And he misses it in the corner, 117 or 129, whatever it was, I don't know if he went inside or out, I can't remember. Um, so, you, you, you know, you, but it's funny, because I was sitting in an interview not long ago, um, at the end of the day, the nine darts only one leg. And the amount of times that the guys have hit a nine darter and lost, it, uh, lost the match, is, is, is what's the name? It, it's, it's surprising. But with Michael, with that, I mean, that was just, that was fabulous. That was fabulous. He'll, he'll tell you that he actually did it more than that because he hit the double, he yeah. hit the double, didn't he? To win the leg before, then done the 17 darters. So. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot here, but is there any moments where you've maybe not kept your call and something might have gone wrong on stage? And how do you recover those? Hey, I've only got to look on YouTube and see. <laughs> Bray makes a mistake, Bray does this, Bray does that. Um, one of the funniest, one of the funniest to me was um, back in the Circus Tavern, I'm calling for Colin Lloyd. And Lloyd has gone 20, 19, and the other dart's gone on the other side of 19. But I made the fatal mistake of not having a proper look. I thought it was in another. Uh, I thought it was in the seven, so I've gone forty six. Lloyd just walked up and put his hands up. Oh no! When I've looked, it's in the nineteen. So I've had the nineteen and nine. I've gone thirty eight. Forgot about the twenty. <laughs> I got sorry, fifty eight. Right, someone because the circus seven was that close. People landing on the stage. He's <laughs> go to go to spec save, mate. You might do yourself some favours, which you heard straight through the telly. And I think that's oh, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, you got you got you know silly things like that, and you've had odds and sods where um, people like uh, uh, I don't know. Um, Robert Thornton when he, you know, when he stumbled and fell and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, there's it's, 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 it's all funny things. Some I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk quickly about the development of the sport in your time. It has changed immeasurably, hasn't it? You've seen it go from small venues, tiny places, to the sport that's taken you around the globe, hasn't it? Did you ever think it could have, get, it could have got to this level and... and What's been the biggest eye-opening thing for you in that time? When we first started, we would be, there'd be a van with a Nokia in it and a dartboard and a, and a couple of um, microphones and a, and a speaker. And we'd pull into a pub and we'd set it up, and board and everything and the speaker, do it, finish the tournament or finish the, the, the um, tour, back in the van and away. Um, you know, now... It's, it's, you know, big trucks and everything's set up for you and everything's done. I never ever thought that it would go anything like it is now. No, no way, no way. Like you said, small, it was pubs. We, you know, we don't use pubs nowadays because, you know, they've got big venues that they use for pro tours and things like that. Um, a pub wouldn't be able to take it now because it's gone that big and the amount of players that come through and everything else developing. Um, the development side of the darts itself, when you look at from when we done it, uh, when I joined in 96 to what it is now, um, uh, the, the, the difference is so far apart. One, you've got an awful lot of players in depth now, which we didn't have then. Um, two, you've got two tours prior to the pro tour. So you've got a development tour and a challenge tour. So you've got an awful lot of players in there. And when you get to the actual Pro Tour itself, the um, quality in depth now, um, like I said earlier on, you know, 32 people can win the World Championship. I know it's 96 in it, not, you know, there's some people that will not win the World Championship, whatever way around you do it. But there's 32 there that can, you know, which we never had before, back in, back in 96, you know, there was only one, maybe two people, Phil Taylor, or, or Dennis Priestley in those days, if you know what I mean. Um, so now you can go from number one to number 32 and that, they, they could win the World Championships. When you look at, you know, outsiders winning tournament, Andrew Gilding, when he won the UK Open, he was a favourite to win that. But Andrew Gilding, yeah, was good enough to win it. And that's what you're going to have in the World Championships. You've got a lot of people that can do it, which we didn't have early, early doors. But that's only where it's developed, where it's got bigger and better and better. And, and that's the massive, massive big thing I've seen over the, you know, 20 odd years that I've been doing. So those iconic moments that you've been a part of, the game growing immeasurably, but what's maybe been the one 
pinch me moment for you where you're going, I cannot believe that I'm here? Is there anything that sticks out? Yeah, well, there's quite a few, if I'm being honest. Um, it's funny, because if I'm at a tournament, I look at the stage. Yeah, so I'm stood there at the dartboard. I look at the dartboard, and you look underneath, or look above, and mine says, Asian Tour Mongolia. Or it says, um, World Series in Australia. You know, and you think, wow, you know, pinch yourself, jeepers, you know, I am actually here in this country. My, my trip to Australia in August was my 40th. 40th time in Australia. People are lucky if they ever go once, you know, and, and that was my 40th and I've got more to come. Um, but it's, when you look at things like that, go to Australia, go to New Zealand, go to America, go to Africa, go to all the places in Asia, you know, and touch all those. Go to, you know, a lot of people would not have gone to Mongolia, you know, I've been there a couple of times now, fantastic place to go. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's things like that that you turn and say, well, you know, it's, it's not just one singular place that I can turn around and say, wow, because there's a lot of wows in my life. That brings us neatly on to your new role with the PDC. Yep. So you're not going anywhere, Russ. No, We're no, no, no. It's no. still going to be about yep. PDC ambassador, Russ Bray. Perfect man for the job, aren't you? I hope so. I, I, I've, I've got an awful lot of input that I can... I can certainly, you know, push forward. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I'm, t- I'm really relishing. I'm really relishing that particular, that particular role, particular title. Um, because as I say, there's an awful lot out there still to be done, and there's an awful lot that you know we can still give, and that we can still go. And we're riding the crest of a wave, and we're going at a, a fantastic rate of knots. And I don't see the end of that wave splashing down at all. You know, not in not in the time that I'm going to be doing you know, the ambassador role there. So it, there's, I, there's a lot more that we can develop in the game, definitely. You know, get it um, bigger and better in worldwide, as opposed to, you know, I mean, here, Holland, Germany, um, you know, it's, it's been mega established for a long, long, long time. Um, we're getting there in Asia. We are getting there. Um, and there will be a Phil Taylor, a Ray Barneville, there'll be a, a, a Gerwin Price, a Mark Van Gerwin, in Asia, there'll be one of those, you know, there's, there, there will be because of the amount of people that they have. Um, that are now playing the game and switching slowly from soft tip to steel. So if I can find a Phil Taylor, if I find one, I'll tell you what, we'll find four or five. And then, that, then the game, then watch the game go. You're already in, in your role currently, seeing the growth in, in those areas, but yep. is there any frontiers that you feel need to be conquered by the PDC? Or could be con- conquered by darts? Um, with respects to... Places that you perhaps haven't been with the darts that you feel, you know... Yeah, definitely. I de- um, I've been to India. I've called in India at a tournament, but India's one big place. Really. And also, if you look at East Africa, apparently the darts in East Africa is... is, is I moved down to South, but East Africa and, and, and West Africa, yeah, why not? You know, there's, there's darts out there. Um, and I'm, fingers crossed, hoping that I can get older people out there that I can go and develop and push forward there, you know, that, that's certainly a place. Also, South America, I haven't really touched South America at all, you know, in, in that sense. So there's another place that's, I've been invited out to Chile, believe it or not. So uh, watch this space, who knows, who knows. Let's take away from the hockey slightly in your, your new role. Um, people, fans of the PDC have seen you comprise different roles for the PDC. <laughs> for example, acting roles Yep. in a number of our PDC adverts, for yep. example, at Christmas. It's always a fun time, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's awesome. It's, and they've been so, so, well, you've, you've been involved with a lot of them yourself, Lou, you know, but um, they're just so funny. How you guys think it up year in, year out, it goes beyond me, but, uh, but it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I really love it. I, lo- I love this time of year anyway, because it, the festive season, everyone's happy in general, you know. The weather can be a little bit naff, but, um, you know, in, in all honesty, everybody's sort of buzzing up for Christmas, and, you know, Christmas is the World Championships. And let's also talk about, it was mentioned by your good friend Johnny Mack, uh, your penchant for a flamboyant suit or two over the years. You've had some good ones, Russ, haven't oh, you? Mate. I'll t- even here, uh, uh, when we first came here, we, was, we used to be at the Civic in, in Wolverhampton. And um, ITV took us out to a suit shop just around the corner to the Civic itself. 
and that filmed it and all the such like. And it's glittery blue suit. It's absolutely glittery blue suit. I mean, it was horrific to be fair. Um, but because they bought it and they filmed it and done it, you know, I wore it in the final and uh, yeah, I've been ripped for it ever since. You know what I mean? But one of the funniest things was in Vegas, and uh, I bought a short sleeve light blue, light blue safari suit. Like short sleeve, it was like that. And uh, done the calling and done Vegas, and I wore that suit the once, and that was it. Went away. That was in the June, in the July. We're at Blackpool for the World Match Play, and uh, I put the suit on again. So that called it. Come off the stage, Tommy Cox, tournament director. Come here, mate. I won't do his accent because he was the Geordie, yeah. He said, Come here, mate. I said, Smell. He said, You're going to be wearing that. I said, Why? He said, It's got no arms in it. I said, Tommy, I wore it in Vegas last month. He went, Did you? <laughs> I said, I'd worn it before. And then he turned around and said to me, He said, Russ, you'll have to come through me so I can check to see what you're wearing. I said, Tommy, are you sure? I said, you wear a green shirt with blue shorts, yellow socks and white trainers. I said, and I've got to come through you as a stylist? Yeah, yeah man, it's that sort of thing. But yeah, um, suits. Yeah, yeah I've, had some, I've, had some, I've had some corkers. I've had some tour and all. <laughs> it's not just darts that your voice has taken you to there as well. You've been the voice of McCoy's. Well, quite a crisp, yeah. Number of adverts. Yep. People still here on the radio today. Stoptober, for example, was a recent one. Oh, well, uh, um, Sober for October. Yep. Correct. That, yep. was, uh, that was for Cancel the Billion and the rest of it. That raised over seven and a half million pounds, which is, which is fantastic over the five years of that run. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of, a lot of voiceovers in, in um, I was on a kid's CD that I'd done where I had to sing on it, which was, which was amazing because I don't even talk in tune, but I had to sing on this thing and that's waiting to go into, um, to be an animated film. Um, but they've changed a lot of the, the cast off the actual CD um, into A-listers. Uh, Ewan McGregor, uh, Helen and Bonner Carter, David Williams on it, you know, and they kept myself, which is, you know, is the Riverside scene, which is lovely. But it's um, loads of, and I love doing voiceovers because they are such good fun. You can get your teeth into, into some funny, real, some funny stuff. A couple of animations where you voice a father swan who's also very regal. And then you've got, you know, daddy mouse, eh, talk to like that, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, 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 they're such great fun to do. I love the voice actors. So, Russ, what do you feel you're going to miss the most about being a PDC referee and your time around the group that we have here? You've, at just, PDC? you've just said it. In and around the group that we've got, you know, the, the, the lads that I'm working with, um, our, the other referees, our, our markers, um, the back crew, you know, the, the, the stage guys, and the security boys. I mean, if you ever had a camera around the back there, it's such a laugh. We do have such a laugh, you know, backstage. Um, that's probably something I'll miss, you know, which hopefully, if I'm at a tournament, which, you know, being the best, hopefully I can get to, you know, or be invited to some of the tournaments and go there backstage, then, uh, you know, I'll still, I'll still have a little bit of that. But uh, that's one thing that I really, will, I really will miss. Well, Russ, I'm sure you will smash your new role as an ambassador, but let me be the first to say congratulations on a magnificent career and it's a fitting way to go out. The 30th World Championship, your last ever final. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Lou. Thank you.